Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're so very happy you've all joined us today. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MCSH Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of those needs. To enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Your presenters today are Sophie Lalonde Bester and Danielle Cassis Akal, who are two third year dietetic students at McGill University. Before continuing, we would just like to remind you to please mute your microphone on Zoom, and that if you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat box on Zoom or ask them directly to the presenters at the end of the event. And now I'd like to invite our presenters to start their presentation Eat and Age Well, Food for Your Bones. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophie, and I'm one of our two presenters. Um, I'm here with Danielle. Hi everyone. Um, just before we begin, I want to do a little bit of chat box practice with everyone. So we have a question for you. Let's see if I can pull it up. Uh, whoop, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, here's our question. So the question is, how would you rank your cooking skills from one to five? One being, I would probably set my kitchen on fire if I tried. Or five, I am a master chef. So please punch your answer into the chat box if you want, um, just so we can get an idea of everyone's cooking skills. Oh, I see a three, I see a 3.5, four, one. <laughs> Thanks everyone, keep putting your answers in. Oh, we got a five. We have a master chef. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. It seems like everyone's cooking skills are kind of across the board, but luckily the recipe that we have today um, will be suitable for everyone. So let's get started. So we've already introduced ourselves, but my name is Sophie and I'm on the left and my partner Danielle is on the right. So on the menu today, we are gonna start with some osteoporosis basics. Then we will deep dive into nutrition for bone health and everything that you can eat and change in your diet to manage your bone health. Then we will go into our demonstration of salmon burgers with fresh coleslaw. And we'll close off today with some food safety and leftover tips um, with the recipe. So thank you, Sophie, for the introduction. Let me introduce briefly what is osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is a bone disease that weakens your bones and make them more likely to break. They can become so fragile that in serious case, a small sneeze or a minor bump can cause a fracture. And in fact, after an initial bone fracture, you will become five times more likely to suffer from a bone break within one year. So if you're wondering why you haven't heard about osteoporosis before, the reason that it is a silent disease where you can't see or feel bone loss. So it goes unnoticed until the first break occurs. Fractures can occur in any bone, but most often in the bones of the hip, spine, and wrist. So if you can notice on the picture, the first picture, a person has normal bone. So he has normal bone density and normal solid structure. But in the second picture, there is holes and spaces that are much larger than the healthy bone. The, the, the holes and spaces are demonstrated by black spots. So therefore the bone is less dense and is more likely to break. So before continuing, let's talk about bone growth. Bone mass accumulates, especially in childhood and adolescence. Then at the age of 30, we reach our maximum bone mass. For men, they tend to have a higher peak bone mass than women, and they slowly lose it uh, over time. For women, they tend to have a lower peak bone mass than men, but they experience rapid loss after menopause. So how likely you are to develop 
osteoporosis, which depends partly on how much bone mass you have attained in your youth. This is why it's really important to encourage your grandchildren to attain their maximum uh, peak bone mass when they are young. But even for your age, there are still ways that, that we will discuss later to keep your bones strong and prevent osteoporotic fractures. So here we have a question. You can uh, take a guess in the chat box also. Um, what is the percentage of Canadian adults that will suffer from osteoporotic fracture? So, so feel Sophie free would to want take to... A... Yeah. Sorry. Feel free to take a wild guess in the chat box. I see a 60, I see a 40, 20. Okay, we got lots of 50%. Answers are slowing down. Good. Keep those answers coming in. All right. So, Danielle, it looks like our answers are kind of all across the board from as low as 12 to as high as 70. So, the response is one in three women, or 33%, and one in five men, or 20% of men, will suffer from osteoporotic fracture during their lifetime. This is a lot. But yeah, you, you were near the, the response. So who is at higher risk? There's no single cause for osteoporosis, but there are several factors that can increase your risk of developing the disease. Some of the factors that you can change while others you can't. Now, both men and women are at risk for developing osteoporosis and osteoporotic fracture. However, women are disproportionately affected as we have seen before. So especially postmenopausal women, since they have a lower peak bone mass and they have smaller bones than men. But if you're a man, you're still at risk, but it's more later in life where after 70 years old. Uh, old age will also increase your risk where your body will start to break down bones much faster than it can to replace it. Also being a smoker, drinking a lot of alcohol, having low physical activity and prolonged period of inactivity all can contribute to um, increased rate of bone loss. And finally, your diet, such as diet high in processed food, which can be high in sodium, which can also cause you to lose bone mineral and hence bone mass. But with all that, let's talk about good lifestyle a habit that you can adopt because there are several and like many ways that you can maintain your bone health now. So some of the stuff that you can adopt is exercising regularly as it, it will help you build your bone mass and strength. It can improve your coordination and your balance and all those benefits will lower your risk from falling. You can check also some of the exercise on the YouTube channel of the McGill Research Center for Studies in Aging for some, uh, some uh, examples. Also, you can go easy on the drinking, so drink alcohol in moderation. And in fact, the new guidelines suggest to not have more than one drink uh, for female and more than two drinks for male in one day. And finally, you can quit smoking or even try to quit smoking and also reduce the second uh, hand smoking, which has been also shown to increase your osteoporosis risk. Now, what can we do nutritionally to manage our bone health as we, as we age? So this is the Canada's Food Guide Balance Plate Model. And this model will anchor us through today's presentation as well as our next three presentations through the month of April. This is the foundation of healthy eating and this was created by Health Canada. So as you can see on the plate model, um, it rec Health Canada recommends to have plenty of vegetables and fruits and they make up half of your plate. They also encourage to choose whole grain foods, which should make up a quarter of your plate, and to also eat protein foods, a variety of protein foods, which also make up a quarter of your plate. And then last, to make water your drink of choice. So as we will go through the presentation today, Danielle and I will focus mainly on calcium, vitamin D, and protein foods. But just remember that despite the specifics, this is your anchor. This is what you should always come back to. Um, and always aim for a balanced plate, um, and that should be your go-to. So with that, let's dive into calcium, our first nutrient of the day. 
So our bones act as calcium banks. So you can think of an RRSP actually with this. So in your um, young adult years, you buy into your RRSP, you invest, but then you don't want to tap into your RRSP too early. You want to save that RRSP for when you're older. You don't want to tap into it when you're 40, for example. So our bones are kind of like that. So with a diet rich in calcium and rich in calcium, oh my God, in foods high in calcium, sorry, your bones will get nice and strong. Whereas with a diet that doesn't have much calcium, your bones will be weak. So as we age, the maintenance crew that builds our bones gets tired and less efficient. Our bones get broken down faster than they get rebuilt. And calcium is also absorbed less effectively as we age. So as per Osteoporosis Canada, studies of older adults actually show that adequate calcium intake can slow bone loss and lower our risk of fracture. So calcium is really important. So how much calcium do we need and where do we get it? So men aged 51 to 70 need 1000 milligrams of calcium per day. Whereas women aged 51 to 70 need a little bit more. They need 1200 milligrams per day. And then all adults over the age of 71 need 1200 milligrams per day. So try to think of where you are in these categories and remember your number. So now where do we get calcium in our diet? Some of you probably know that the best sources of calcium are dairy products. So this includes any percentage of milk, whether it be whole, 2%, 1%, skim, or even chocolate. This also includes yogurt, um, usually the plain variety, that's one to 2% milk fat. And then also cheeses like brick, cheddar, gouda, gruyere, and Swiss cheeses are really good sources of calcium. And then in addition to dairy products, fortified orange juice and fortified soy and other plant-based beverages are also excellent sources of calcium. We'll go more into these in a second. But these best sources of calcium all have around 250 to 300 milligrams of calcium per serving. So with some quick math, you need four to five of these per day to meet your needs on average. But then there's other sources of calcium that are good, like other cheeses, like mozzarella and cottage cheese, or flavored yogurts, like the vanilla and raspberry ones that you see in the grocery store. Ice creams too are good. And then canned salmon with the bones is also great. So is tofu, if some of you eat tofu. And last, some other more miscellaneous sources that are good as part of a healthy diet are beans, greens like kale, processed cheese slices like Kraft Singles, if that's the cheese that you like to eat, um, dried figs, almonds, some white breads, and blackstrap molasses. So I mentioned fortified orange juice and fortified soy beverages. What are these? What is fortification? So fortified foods are foods that have nutrients added to them. The nutrients don't occur naturally, but they're added in the manufacturing process. And fortified foods can optimize some, your intake of some nutrients that you might not be eating enough of. So if we look at the picture here, the orange juice and the soy beverage, the red arrow is pointing to this. It says calcium and vitamin D added. And then here it says fortified soy beverage. So that's what you should look for at the grocery store when you're looking for these foods. And then did you know, Canada food laws require that all meal replacements be fortified with calcium. So Ensure and Boost are fortified with calcium and are excellent calcium sources. So let's put this into practice. So I took nutrition labels from fortified orange juice and regular orange juice. The fortified one is on the left and the regular orange juice is on the right. So let's practice comparing nutrition facts tables. These are found on the sides of food packages. So when we're comparing nutrition facts tables, the first thing we wanna do is check the serving size. So if we check the serving size for both of these orange juices, they're both 250 milliliters, which means we can compare them one to one. So since we're just focusing on calcium right now, let's go all the way down to the red box and we see calcium here. 
In the fortified orange juice, we have 30% daily value of calcium. And in the regular orange juice, we have 2% daily value of calcium. To interpret this, we use this little chart here where anything 5% or less is a little. So our regular orange juice only has a little bit of calcium and 15% or more is a lot. So our fortified orange juice with 30% has a lot of calcium. So just on a note uh, for lactose-free and vegetarian calcium sources, because we know that dairy products are high in calcium, but you can still meet your calcium needs if you follow lactose-free or vegetarian diets. So we talked about fortified soy beverage, and this beverage is actually nutritionally the most similar to cow's milk and is part of Canada's Food Guide's protein foods group. So this is in comparison to like almond milk, rice milk, cashew milk. So when you're picking a plant-based beverage, soy beverage would be my go-to because it's most similar to cow's milk and it's considered a protein food. Then the calcium in some foods like sesame seeds, rhubarb, Swiss chard, and spinach is not that well absorbed because there's a compound in these foods called oxalate, which binds the calcium in your intestines and it makes it a little bit harder to absorb. So these are not great sources of calcium, but they're still part of a healthy diet. And last, if you eat tofu, tofu is prepared with calcium sulfate, making it a really good source of calcium. Little fun fact. So we have a quiz here. So if you can pull up your chat box again, that'd be great. So we need to help Mrs. J increase the calcium in her breakfast. So Mrs. J is having two pieces of toast with peanut butter and a cup of tea. So in the chat box, let us know if you have any ideas for how Mrs. J can increase the amount of calcium in her breakfast. Okay, I'm not seeing anything yet. Okay, I see cream cheese on the toast, milk in her tea. Very oh, good. milk and tea came up again. Cheese and milk, that's very good. Glass of milk, add banana slices. Yeah, you can add fruit, add cheese and orange juice. That's good, fortified orange juice. Good, oh, we're seeing such good ideas. Yogurt on the side. Oh, you guys are experts. Yeah. Okay, you guys can keep the answers coming, but we'll share what Danielle and I had come up with. So a lot of these were mentioned already, but Danielle and I thought that Mrs. J could add milk or a glass of fortified soy, or sorry, add milk or fortified soy beverage to her tea, or she could have a glass of fortified orange juice. Remember that orange juice only has calcium if it's the fortified kind. She also could add a bowl of regular yogurt, have a few slices of cheese, and then she could also have a latte or a cappuccino instead of her tea, because these have a lot of milk in them. And then just to make the meal more balanced, we figured she could have a bowl of fruit or a banana and use whole grain toast. So really good ideas, guys. Remember that fruit itself doesn't necessarily have calcium, but it's good to have it as part of a balanced diet. And just as a little comparison, let's say Mrs. J added a bowl of yogurt and some milk to her tea. Her breakfast would go from having 76 milligrams of calcium to having 488 milligrams of calcium. So small things can go a long way. Let's try another one. Let's help Mrs. J increase the amount of calcium in her lunch. This one might be a little bit trickier. So she's having a sandwich with some turkey deli meat and a tomato soup. So what can Mrs. J do to increase the calcium in her lunch? There is also a question in the chat box. What about freshly squeezed orange juice? Does it have enough calcium? No, as Sophie already said, the, the orange juice does not have calcium. It's only the fortified one where they add calcium to it when they're manufacturing it. So orange juice does not have calcium. Naturally. Thanks, Danielle. Okay, let's see your ideas to increase Mrs. J's calcium in her lunch. So Faye said add cheese. 
milk and cheese. Yes. Good. So it seems like the main idea is to add a slice of cheese to the sandwich. Oh, good. Rose said add cream to the tomato soup. Ooh. That's good. Okay, let's see. You can keep your answers coming in. But let's take a look at what Danielle and I had thought for Mrs. J. So as you guys, as most of you guessed, she could add some cheese to her sandwich and she could also have a soup made with milk or cream because tomato soup is mostly just tomato. But if you add some milk or some cream, it can definitely, it can make the soup creamier and increase your calcium. We also thought she could add a few tablespoons of plain yogurt to the soup or have a glass of milk or fortified soy beverage on the side. So good job, everyone. And then to make the meal more balanced, we figured she could add some leafy greens to her sandwich. So good job, everyone. Thanks for your contributions. And if we do a little side by side here, when Mrs. J adds a couple slices of cheese to her sandwich and three tablespoons of plain yogurt to her soup, her lunch goes from having 86 milligrams of calcium to 390 milligrams of calcium. So thanks for participating in that activity, everyone. And so I saw a question in the chat box asking about calcium supplements. So should you be taking one? Short answer is it depends actually. And if you think you're not getting enough calcium from your diet, you should speak to your healthcare provider or your family physician or doctor about whether you should be taking a calcium supplement. Unfortunately, this is a question that we can't really answer because everyone's situation is so unique and we don't want to cause any harm, like if the supplement interacts with your medications or anything. So this is a really good question for your doctor. So perfect. Now, as you have seen with calcium, vitamin D is also important for your bone health. In fact, without vitamin D, our body cannot effectively absorb calcium from our intestine. And absorbing calcium from our intestine will help us, as a result, build stronger bones. And also vitamin D can improve muscle function. So by acting both on our bones and muscles, vitamin D can improve our balance, decrease the likelihood of falling, and also protect against a fracture risk. So as you might have known, vitamin D is called the, the sunshine vitamin because our skin makes it after sun exposure. The problem is in Canada, since we live in the Northern Hemisphere, we don't get as much sun as we need to, to produce adequate vitamin D. And also when we are exposed to the sun, we are covered in layers of cloth in the winter or we're wearing sunscreen in the summer, which can both affect our ability to produce vitamin D. And also as we age, unfortunately, our skin ability to produce vitamin D also decreases. So that's why it's really important to add vitamin D rich food to our diet. Um, so in some case, um, we recommend adults above 50 years old uh, to, to, to have a vitamin D uh, supplement of 400 international units daily. So this, your physician will tell you about it. Uh, so how much vitamin D do we need and where can we get it? Uh, men and women of 51 years old to 70 years old, they will need around 600 international units. And above 70 years old, they would need about 800 international units. So for the food sources of vitamin D, some food sources have naturally vitamin D in them, and such as fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, and also some egg yolks. And other items have vitamin D added in them, like fortified orange juice, fortified cereal, and fortified uh, milk. Some fortification are also mandatory, like in milk and margarine, whereas in yogurt, plant-based beverage like soy, almond, rice beverage, and cheese fortification, you need to check on the nutrition fact table to see if the vitamin D was added. Yeah, go. I open. I'm, yeah, I'm doing it. So also an interesting fact, mushroom is the only vegetable that contains vitamin D uh, naturally when it is exposed to UV light. And in fact, most food fortification use the source uh, of uh, vitamin D in their fortification from mushrooms. So what about vitamin D supplements? Vitamin D supplements, although it is recommended for people above 50 years old, 
um, you should always verify with your doctor before starting any kind of supplements as it can interact with other medication. And the sub best supplement to get uh, is vitamin D3, which comes naturally from animal sources. Whereas the vitamin D2, which is in the market and it comes from plant sources like mushroom, um, is less uh, effective because some studies have showed that vitamin D3 can increase your, your vitamin D levels in your blood much more effectively than vitamin D2. Okay, so now we have talked about calcium and vitamin D, but we can't forget about protein foods. Remember that protein foods were a quarter of the balanced plate model on Canada's food guide. So protein is actually a major component of bone. It gives bone strength and flexibility, but also protein is really important for muscles, which are crucial for mobility and preventing falls. And actually, adults with limited protein intake are at high risk for bone loss with, and fractures. So on average, women and seniors do not consume enough protein daily. However, lucky for us, a lot of calcium and vitamin D sources are also really great protein sources. So you can kind of kill two birds with one stone here and get your protein sources and your calcium and vitamin D at the same time. So we have a little activity for you again, a little chat box activity. So pull up your chat box and which of these protein foods are rich in calcium and or vitamin D? So we have beef, pork, poultry, fish or fatty fish. We have beans, almonds, eggs, tofu, and dairy. So these are all protein foods, but which of them are also high in calcium or vitamin D? Let us know in the chat box. Take your guess. So we had a response, all salmon, dairy, almonds, fish, milk, cheese, beans, almonds, milk, cheese. So most of people- a couple of them come back a little more often. Good job, guys. Oh, we're getting so many answers. You guys are so good with the chat box. Okay, are we ready for the big reveal? Okay. If you guessed fatty fish, almonds, eggs, tofu, and dairy, you are correct. So those are protein foods that are rich in calcium and or vitamin D. Meats like, um, like beef, pork, and poultry, although they're really high in protein, they're not necessarily sources of calcium or vitamin D. All right. And now here's a little refresher of Canada's food guide, just so you guys can remember what it looks like. So now we've talked about calcium, vitamin D and protein foods. So if you remember, vegetables and fruits are half your plate, protein foods are a quarter of your plate. And this is where we can get a lot of calcium and vitamin D sources. And then whole grain foods are a quarter of your plate. So now let's put this into practice with our recipe demonstration. So now let's, well, we're going to talk about the demonstration of our easy salmon burger with uh, the coleslaw, but first we'll talk about uh, safety. So we'll focus here more on the knife and greater safety since we'll be using them uh, in our uh, cooking demonstration. So for knife safety, always use a sharp knife it, uh, because when you use a dull one, you'll need to apply more force when cutting your food. And as a result, the, the knife is more likely to slip and this will increase your risk of injury. Also choose the right uh, knife for your task and, on, and only use knife to cut food. Don't use them for any other functions. Um, keep also your knife clean. Food residue on your knife can make them slippery. So it's make sure to keep it clean for the most secure grip. And it's also important to clean your knife as soon as you're done using it. Don't leave it in a sink full of soapy water. And finally, always use a cutting board. 
you can also place a damp cloth under your cutting board to prevent slipping of the board. For the greater safety, go slow and watch your knuckles. And also sometimes you can wear some cut resistant gloves, which can add a layer of protection if you're worried. Also use longer strokes for faster grading. So rather than just focusing on the middle of the greater surface, start from the top and end in the bottom. And finally, once you reach a quarter inch of your food, you can stop grading and slice the food using a knife instead, because this, you can hurt your, your, your hand frequently. So why a homemade salmon burger? As you can see in the picture, the cost of one homemade salmon burger is $3.36, which is even cheaper compared to the McDonald's fish au filet, of, uh, which costs $3.79. Uh, and the high-end restaurant burger, which costs $20. Our burger is also rich in vegetables, which has the added benefits to bone health, as Sophie previously explained uh, in the balanced plate model. And other than that, you have the added benefit from cooking your food, where you can choose healthy and fresh ingredients and also buy products that are in line with your value. And there are also other benefits for cooking, like it can improve your mood, it can reduce stress, and it's also fun. So let's start with the cooking demonstration. Okay, so what you will need for the salmon burger, one garlic clove, one yellow onion, one can of salmon, one large egg, breadcrumbs, dill, oregano, lemon zest, pepper, salt, and uh, vegetable oil. You can always uh, follow in, in the PDF that we have attached. So first you have to wash your hand under warm and soapy water. So let's start. Here I'm mincing one small garlic. Be careful when you're cutting your garlic. Sometimes it gets sticky on your hand. And I'm mincing one small onion. You can use half a large one instead. So I'll get one can of salmon. I'll open it and I will keep the bones and the skin of the salmon. I'm not gonna remove anything from it because as Sophie previously said, uh, the bones in the salmon is the source for calcium. Now I'm adding my salmon into a large bowl and I'll be mincing it using a fork. So as I already also said, uh, uh, salmon is good, has uh, calcium and vitamin D and also omega-3. And now I'm adding uh, garlic and onions. I cracked one egg into the mixture. Egg is also a good source of vitamin D. I'm adding two tablespoons of breadcrumbs. You can add panko. You can add uh, ground uh, flakes or pretzels also as substitute. Now I'm adding one teaspoon of dried oregano. You can add one tablespoon of fresh oregano instead. And one teaspoon of dried dill. You can add one tablespoon of fresh dill. I'm obtaining the zest of half a, a lemon. Oh, Danielle, that lemon zest must make your kitchen smell so good, hey? Yeah. <laughs> now I'm adding one pinch of uh, salt. You can add less salt also. It's always better to decrease the amount of salt that you add to your meals. You can substitute it with spices or other herbs. Now I'm mixing all my mixture together. Those are all pretty simple ingredients. That's great. Yeah, and it's easy. It only takes like 10 minutes to do the, the patty. You can always make it and keep it in the freezer afterwards. So now I added ground pepper. I'm dividing my salmon patty into three equal portions. Here, each portion is around one third of a cup. I made small bowls with the patty and now I'm using my, my fingers to flatten it out. I'll do the same thing with the other patties. So one can of salmon here makes three patties. Yes. The one can is, I think, 205 
grams of salmon. So yeah, now you place it in the fridge for 20 minutes. Uh, I'm keeping it in the fridge just so I want, I want it to keep a consistent shape when I'm uh, heating it with the oil. So for the dressing, I'll need Greek yogurt, lemon juice, dill, cucumber, honey or maple syrup, and pepper. So here I'm starting with Greek yogurt. Greek yogurt is a very good source of protein. It has higher protein than regular yogurt, but Greek yogurt unfortunately has less calcium than regular yogurt. So here I'm adding my Greek yogurt. I'm mincing one uh, a half of a cucumber. This will give me around two tablespoons of cucumbers. Now I'm adding my cucumber to the bowl of yogurt. And then I'm obtaining uh, one tablespoon of uh, lemon. I'll use the same lemon that I used to obtain the zest. And I also, I can uh, after that put my lemon in the fridge or even if I have like many lemons, I will uh, squeeze in and put it in the freezer for later use. That's great, it's low waste. Yeah, exactly. It's also handy when you need lemon and you don't have it. So I'm adding uh, one teaspoon of dried dill. You can also add fresh one or even add more if you like. And also one teaspoon of maple syrup. You can add honey or any other sweetener too. This is such a nice and fresh dressing. It's very different than just like putting mayonnaise on a burger. Yeah, it's exactly. So good. And also it's a rich in protein compared to mayo, which is nothing. Yeah. So now I'm mixing it all up. I'm grinding some black pepper. Yum. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the dressing for the burger. Now we'll prepare the coleslaw. Cabbage, we'll, you'll need half a cabbage, two carrots, apple, and for the dressing, you'll need Greek yogurt, maple syrup, cider vinegar, salt, and pepper. You can always buy bagged shredded uh, cabbage uh, where you can find it in the supermarket. It's much easier than cutting your own cabbage. So be careful when you're getting half of a cabbage. I'm removing the leaves and I'll wash it under warm water. Make sure to remove all uh, residue on it. So afterwards, I'll be uh, shredding uh, two carrots. You can always buy shredded carrots from the uh, supermarkets. I find that coleslaw, you can always buy coleslaw at the grocery store, but it's so rewarding to make it yourself because it's yeah, pretty exactly. simple. Yeah, I think also uh, cabbage, carrots, and those, the ingredients for our um, coleslaw today, they are all, they can grow, they are grown in Canada all season. So you can always also find them in the store. And I think they're cheap if you buy them and you do your own cabbage alone. So now I'm cutting um, and peeling my carrots. And carrots are also a really good source of vitamin A, which is really yeah. good for your eyesight. Yeah, exactly. You can also have the red cabbage instead just of the green one to add more color to your uh, colso. So yeah, now I'm shredding my carrots. Cooking is really stress relieving. Do you find it too? Oh yeah, so stress relieving. Yeah. Especially when it's an easy recipe like this that's so delicious and high in calcium and vitamin D too. Yeah. Feels good to eat healthy. So now I'm cutting one small apple. You can have any other uh, kind of foods or any other kind of apple. It's just for your taste and what you have available in your fridge. 
An apple is such a fun way to increase the sweetness too in this salad. Yeah, so, exactly. so cool. So now I'm preparing the dressing for the coleslaw here. We're using also Greek yogurt. So it's the same Greek yogurt that we used before. Just make sure to use a plain one, not a flavored one. Yeah, um, you don't want any vanilla flavor in your coleslaw. <laughs> so add a half a cup of Greek yogurt, one tablespoon of um, maple syrup or any other kind of sweetener, and then two teaspoons of cider vinegar. Here I'm using an apple cider vinegar. You can use whatever cider vinegar that you have. So also here we're using a yogurt instead of mayonnaise in our, in our dressing, which is also, which packs also protein in it. So it's good. Now I'm grounding some black pepper. Also, it's to taste. I like to have mine with a good amount of ground black pepper. Me too. I love black pepper. <laughs> yeah. Some people find it very spicy. I know from my family. So now I'm adding my dressing to the salad. And I'll mix it. Make sure your uh, cabbage is well combined. Also, you don't need to, ha to have this amount of coleslaw. You can do smaller amounts because it doesn't keep well, I found. And so here our calcium source is mainly the yogurt, but then yes. if you wanted to give it a boost, you could even add some kale too. Yeah, and it would add color too. Yeah, you're right. So now we're cooking our salmon patty to one tablespoon of vegetable oil. I'll add my salmon patty. Make sure to heat your oil before and uh, put your salmon patty very slowly. I'm using a spatula because sometimes they tend to break once you're adding them. So here I'm cooking my three salmon patties. You can cook one and then place the others in the fridge if you want for the next day. So, uh, you will have to wait like four minutes before flip, flipping them. And Danielle, is this about medium high heat? Yeah, it's a medium okay. heat. Yeah. So after four minutes on each side, make sure to measure the temperature. It should be around 71 degrees, although the canned salmon is cooked. But here we're adding eggs, raw eggs. We want them to be well cooked before uh, removing them from the heat. So it should be around 71 degrees. And now put it on a separate plate. Now what you will need for the assembly, a tree whole wheat, a hamburger bun, and any kind of leafy greens for serving. It could be cabbage, lettuce, or whatever you have in your uh, fridge. So now I'm assembling my burgers. To each patty, I'm adding one. To each uh, bun, I'm adding one patty. Your presentation is beautiful. Yeah, thank you. This looks so good. Yeah, it also smells good. So uh, I'm adding one tablespoon of the dressing that we have prepared, the, um, the yogurt with the cucumbers. You can add more if you like. And then I'm adding arugula. You can add kale, as Sophie previously said. It's a very also it's a rich source of calcium. Or also you can add the coleslaw that we prepared instead of the the kale or the arugula. So that's it. It's an easy, rapid recipe to do at home. And also have, you can fill a small bowl with coleslaw. You can have much more. As you have seen with the Canada's food guide, have, have half your plate from uh, fruit and vegetables. So for sure you can add much more uh, coleslaw to your plate. And voila, this is our salmon uh, burger with coleslaw. You can serve it with your drink of choice, but we encourage you to serve it with water. Here I'm using water with lemon. 
So um, water is on the Canada's food guide and it should be your drink of choice. All right, so we get back to our presentation now. Just give me a moment. So yeah, what did you think about the recipe, everyone? You can unmute yourself or write in the chat box. And rest assured, you will get the recipe if you have not gotten already. Don't worry. Yeah. Thanks, Teresa. It is delicious. What do you think are some of the modifica modification you might have done? Would anyone have made any changes based on what you have in your fridge at the moment? Thanks for your comments, everyone. I saw that someone asked if you can bake them instead of frying them. Uh, we didn't try it when we made our video, but Rose said that she has baked them or put them on the barbecue. So I'm sure it would work out just fine. You can let us know how it goes. Yeah. Faye says it, look, it looks good, but we'll have to avoid salt. And that's true. And actually, when you're buying canned fish, you can look for canned fish that's low in sodium, if that's something that you're um, trying to limit. So Naomi said, I'm, I'm always afraid to eat fish bones. You won't notice the bones in the canned salmon. They're very like small and like you won't feel them when you're eating your burger. And also the bones in the canned fish is the source of the calcium from the salmon, actually. And those bones actually they soften up through the canning process. So they're not crunchy or anything, even though they look a little funny, it's a really good source of calcium. Yeah. So Malcolm said, I'm allergic to must fish. What can I substitute? Um, it's a tricky one, Malcolm. I guess this recipe isn't really for you. <laughs> any, I guess any veggie burger or meat burger would be good, but that wouldn't be considered a source of calcium anymore. You'd have to have your calcium on the side or in your dressing. I also didn't try a, a tuna uh, burger, um, but I think tuna is even lower than salmon in vitamin D, but yeah, I, I would be interested to try a tuna patty instead of salmon. And Malcolm, sorry, I just, just to add to your question about being allergic to most fish, you can also try like a tofu sandwich or tofu burger, because that's a good source of calcium as well. Okay, thanks so much for your comments, everyone. It's really good to interact with you all. So let's go back to the nutrition fact table that we showed previously. So this is our burger, the, salmon, the homemade salmon burger, and the other one is the fish au filet. Um, if we compare them, our burger has higher protein content, has 28 grams, compared to the fish filet, which contain around 15 grams. Um, our burger is also higher in calcium. It has 27% of what you need in a day, compared also to the 15% in the fish au filet. And finally, our burger has 53% of what you need of vitamin D uh, in a day. Um, and we didn't have any information about the fish au filet vitamin D content. So um, what can we do with the leftovers? Um, I think we have missed a, a few slides before. Oh, sorry, Danielle. Let me go back. Oh yeah, my bad. Skipped over it. So for the food safety, um, let's talk about food safety. The temperature danger zone is between uh, five to 60 degrees, which includes the room temperature. This is why it's really important to keep your hot food hot or above 60 degrees and cold food cold or below five degrees. This is especially important for potentially hazardous food, like food that contains meat, dairy, eggs, cooked rice or pasta, where it is important to keep them out of the temperature danger zone. Another thing is that most leftover food are good only for three to four days in the fridge. Although uh, in the fridge, bacteria can grow much slowly, um, but after three to four days, they can reach an a number that can cause 
food poisoning. So maybe you can try not to keep them longer than three to four days in the fridge. And finally, you can always use your senses to monitor any signs of spoilage, like look at change of an appearance or color or in change in smell of your food. So I tend to follow this rule when in doubt, throw it out. Although it's unfortunate, but it's much better than getting food poisoning from food. Now, what to do with the leftovers? If you did a large batch of salmon patty, you can freeze them before frying. Simply, you just need to put your burger on par parchment paper and layer the burgers uh, between more parchment, then place all those burger in a large bag and put it on a cookie sheet in the freezer for about four hours. And then after that, you can individually wrap your salmon uh, burgers and freeze them in an airtight container for up to three months. And when you want to cook it, just you need to, uh, you need to throw it in the refrigerator uh, overnight before reheating. Uh, to store it um, after it has been cooked, uh, you can store the burgers and the sauce separately, of course, in airtight storage containers for up to three days. You can also freeze it for up to uh, three months, but I think the quality of the salmon patty would be much lower. And finally, for the coleslaw, it's best when consumed on the same day. Therefore, but you can still uh, refrigerate it uh, within two hours of, of making it, and you can keep it for in the fridge for up, up to three days. So thanks, Danielle, for letting us know all the details about the salmon burgers. Um, so we're almost at the end of our presentation. I know we've kept you guys for almost an hour by now. Um, I really hope that you've learned something and that you can retain some of this information. Just before we head out, we wanted to let you guys know that there's really great resources online. And these are three of our favorite ones. Um, these three websites will be linked on the recipe PDF. If you can see them, they're on the same page as the coleslaw recipe. So the first resource is Osteoporosis Canada. They have a really fantastic website with information, recipes, and advice. And they even have a web page with a whole bunch of past webinars. If you're interested in more information on nutrition and bone health or want to dive in deeper, Fight Back is a really great website for food safety tips and tricks. Um, if you feel like you're maybe neglecting this aspect in your cooking or you want to add a little bit more to what Danielle has told us about, I recommend you um, peruse their website. And then last, Canada's Food Guide is fantastic for healthy eating basics, recipes, and tips. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we welcome any of your questions um, on the chat box or you can unmute yourself. I guess I just want to address um, one question from Julia W. Um, I think she mentioned something in the chat box about vitamin D and calcium supplements and bone density. And you linked um, a journal article, Julia. So thanks so much. We'll check that one study out. But I don't know if Danielle, you wanted to add something to that. Um, no, for the, for the question about uh, calcium and vitamin D. Um, but there's another question about, can we use fresh salmon instead of canned one? Um, also, the fresh salmon doesn't have bones, so it wouldn't uh, have as much calcium as the canned uh, salmon. Um, for, for the other question about calcium and vitamin D supplements, I think it's much better to always consult your doctor about if you want to take any calcium or vitamin D, but we would always uh, encourage you to get your calcium and vitamin D from food. So, yeah. But so today's uh, lecture is part of a four part series that we're doing for the month of April called Eat and Age Well. Um, so if you attend any of our two uh, lectures for this month and you make a donation to MCSA, you will receive a, a complimentary Brainy Boomer apron that uh, Danielle and Sophie were wearing. Um, the link for our donations page is in the chat box. I'll also put it in that email. But if you're more comfortable making a donation by check or maybe you want to call in and just do it by phone, um, I'll put all that information in the email as well, but I did put it uh, in our chat box. You can reach out to um, Silvana. Her phone number is in the chat box. Again, I'll put it in the email. Um, and all checks can be made payable to the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. Thank you.